over to our chair, David Dury, who'd like to say a few words. We welcome you. Thanks very much, Pat. And it's my really great and pleasant task to welcome you all to this, another in our series of webinars that explore the, the many facets of the wonderful island of, of South Georgia. Now, I think as many of you know, it's Earth Day today. So it's really rather fitting that the government of South Georgia and the South Sandwich Islands has just published the implementation and delivery plan for their stewardship of these islands. And that covers items like environmental resilience, biosecurity, which we all of course know about with the RAP program, culture, heritage, science, and the global and regional responsibility of the government uh, of South Georgia in that context. So if you want to learn a little bit more about that, then look on the Government of South Georgia website. Well, tonight's three talks a look back and also look forward, but based upon the events of 40 years ago when the, the government, uh, when the uh, South Georgia Islands and of course later the Falkland Islands were invaded. Now, I'd like in advance before the talks to thank our three speakers. Uh, that's Bob Headland, Pat Lurcock, and Jamie Coleman. I'd also like to thank uh, people who've been organizing the webinar. Uh, that's Paul Rodhouse and looking after all of these Zoom connections, Sarah Greenwood. Now, finally, uh, for those of you who may not be members of the association, do come and join us, share our passion for this very special place and receive information about our various other events that we organize from time to time. So look on the South Georgia Association website where you can get further details. Now, without further ado, because we all want to listen to the talks, I'm handing you back over to Pat. Great, thanks very much, David. Um, yeah, we'll have a, as we have to do in all talks, a little bit of housekeeping to start with. For those of you at home, you know where the emergency exits are and where the toilets are, so I don't need to go through that bit for you. Um, hopefully we'll um, elicit a few questions. Um, not sure how we'll do for time for answering them, but pop them in the chat and we'll see after we've all had a, a ch chance to um, give our presentations, we'll have a look through and see if there are any burning questions there that we'd like to talk about. Um, yeah, so that's, yeah, if you can also, everyone make sure you keep, you keep yourselves um, muted, then we won't get clicks and pops and suddenly find everyone's watching you eating your Rice Krispies or whatever you're eating this time of the evening. So this evening then, <coughs> excuse me. Um, yeah, we, we're marking four, 40 years on from when Argentina briefly took over South Georgia and the Falkland Islands, which is a, a small archipelago just off Bird Island. Um, but mainly it was all about South Georgia, of course. Um, we're marking 40 years on and, and we're going to learn a bit on, and to show you a bit about how life has changed, how things have moved on since then, um, and hopefully for the better. And so we've got three, three of us going to tell you a little bit about it. First of all, Bob Headland, who was there at the time in 1982 and got, got the whole thing firsthand. And then I'll say a little bit about a period a bit later on when the army and the military, the British military was still based on the island when, when I first went there. Um, and that'll lead up to the British Antarctic Survey moving back in and taking over the logistics of the place. And then finally, Jamie Coleman will give you a few words, um, a bit of a picture of what life is like on South Georgia now as a scientist. And then, as I said, if you've got any questions, um, pop them in the chat and we'll see if we can answer them later. So let's start then. Um, and Bob Headland, over to you. Tell us about the war. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a mixture of slides from many sources, some from my, some of my own, old E4 frame developing kit on base, and various other things where I want to try to give an idea of the events of 40 years ago, particularly those involving that. Basically, the Menonites, not only were they uh, much associated with events, but also I should mention the Bass Ships for uh, Bansfield in particular, also associated with that 
74 days of hostilities and a war, or the shorter on South Georgia. There's many, many military accounts, but bass, men on shore and ships, quite frequently less uh, well covered. But with illustrations, now we're working. One can, ah, we were working, excuse me. There is a little bit of a delay between pressing the button and the slide changing, but I think we'll carry on with that. To begin, just to refresh one's mind, the first landing and claim of South Georgia was 1775, although it had been sighted prior to that. And to try to solve the somewhat complicated problem of sovereignty, Britain in 1955 put a case before the International Court of Justice, which replied that as Argentina and Chile, both of which had claims in the Falklands dependencies in those days, declined to uh, test their case before the court, the case was withdrawn, which hardly showed they had the highest confidence in the problems. Anyway, advance quickly. Base M, King, King Edward Point, 1982. This actually ended up as a Bass postcard. The Shackleton's Cross, the large building of Shackleton House, and the pleasant little village of King Edward Point at that time, Gritvik and Whaling Station in the background, and for photographs like this, one always waits for a good clear day. The base itself, going down the shingle spit, King Edward Point, you can see it in the summer and roughly a winter, although quite a long year was like that. Shackleton House, a major asset, built when whaling was about to come to an end and civil administration was expected to be there. Lasted over 40 years. Big, spacious, comfortable building. Although when there was a hoolie, it had a slight tendency to try to take off. I rather like the view of the point from Brown Mountain on the other side of a bay. It didn't have drones or helicopters or anything at that time. You walked up Brown Mountain. Upper left, Discover Us, 1925, Scientific Laboratory, beginning of a long period of whaling research. Upper right, the Met Enclosure, began, began on South Georgia in 1905, moved to King Edward Point, 1907, and it's the second longest continuous records of Antarctic meteorology. We had a small navy, the Admiralty, bottom left has them, and the base, base office, which was also post office and so forth, there it is in the bottom right. And uh, having spent a while in Cambridge, I did bring that mode of transport on, which was useful for a lot of things while it lasted. Base up left, football field behind the whaling station, that and one other item, which I'll mention in a few moments, are the only things still preserving their original functions. There were cartoons, a famous whaling uh, manager at Husvik uh, produced this one. We've got land whales with the tractors and various stories at a time when whaling was becoming scarcer and scarcer. Very extensive library in Shackleton Huts and quite a good bar. The book situation was if a man brought a good book down, it was considered not quite pucker to take it away. You tended to leave it and there was a good accumulation. In those days, we had domestic, well, we had mammals on the island, two, one domestic and two non. There's the rat you can see, recently gone, the principal rat catcher, we only had one of those, and the delicious reindeer. In Christmas, we used to shoot Bambi and Rudolph, and uh, an inquisitive fur seal. In my days, fur seals were so rare, if they turned up at King Edward Point, you wrote them in the fur seal observation book, and some of them really got profoundly upset by what we would call shutter shock. Not forget the science. As a young man who looks rather like me before I started changing hair colour on one side, David Walton and Tim Flood directing pollen posts for upper atmospheric sampling of uh, microsporomorpha. The marine biology was a major function with diving and all the facilities and a lot of rather squashy invertebrates. And a bit of collection of samples on Glacier Coll. Now, there was a small hut also illustrated. Radio ZBH. Everything was basically uh, the telex. You could just see a Creed teleprinter in the left, or occasionally Morse, or locally, of course, voice. Uh, the old Ionosod that used to make a racket through all the loudspeakers in the building, the Beastie, was just finishing in 1982. Griffin and the whaling stations. They weren't very ruinous. After all, they'd been mothballed fairly well to some extent until 1971, there was a caretaker in Grootvigan. That's what it looked like then. It's had a rather hard life for a number of reasons past that. Notice the church, 
That's the only other building that maintains its original function. A better view of it with a bit more snow around. The dissecting plan, the whaling plan, with the king in the middle of it, the buildings, the factories were largely intact. And Louise, an old down easter that arrived in South Georgia in 1904. You can see her bulk ports when she was involved in the Scandinavian timber trade. She was intact before a few years later there was a fire and her obituary, her obituary written in the record. Strodness was an engineering station, originally a whaling station, but for ship repairs for most of its time, you can see a general view of it. It had two floating docks originally. In uh, the first time I was there, only one was left. Vast amount of rather useful metal, phosphor bronze propellers, all sorts of machines and so forth, which attracted Constantino Davidoff, who I'd regard as, at the beginning, a fairly straightforward scrap metal dealer, and there was a lot of scrap metal. Leith was interesting from other aspects. Christian Salverson and company had kept records very carefully, much detail about all the operations. And here are some of them in an attic in Leith. We'd recovered those beginning of 1981, and they're now in the archives of the University of Edinburgh, with much of the rest of the archives from Leith. A lot of the circumstances in the South Georgia whaling stations are known from these carefully kept papers, or you will see those on the left have various problems. Uh, when you're sorting archives, it's, uh, you don't very often come across rat's nest. World War II. There were defences, four inch, roughly 100 mil guns over Leith and near Gritviken at Horsehead. The bottom right, you can see there's a Polish trawler in a rather interesting position from the point of view of that, uh, that cannon that had had better days. If that still worked, it could have saved a lot of public money in 1982. Field huts, something that uh, was around the island, which for Terrestrial programs and various other things were used a lot. There's the old Jason Harbour hut inside and outside, built by the whalers, goes back to 1923. Sterling Valley hut, bottom left. The thing on the right was a box for instruments. I suppose we could call it a hut, but you can see me trying to get out of it. That was one of the Mybican huts where we had terrestrial reference sites, four on the island, instrumented for various uh, climatological surveys. Myvican Hut, upper left, Hound Valley, uh, Hound Bay Hut, upper right, that was to be extended, but there was a slight miscalculation in the size of it when someone was reading a ruler, and the hut at Carlita Bay, with someone sitting outside it, which was one used on the way to get from Gritviken to the other whaling stations. Either on arrival, one generally went all the way through, on the way back, you spent the night in there waiting for the Cindy Buxton and Annie Price were on the island in 1982 making some wildlife films. There they are in the upper image, taken from their book, as are the two images aside of them. Royal Bay, reindeer program, you can see the exclosure, little hut there. And just above Gull Lake was something that looks like, well, no, is an old um, fiberglass uh, road mender's um, hut. Uh, that didn't last long because during the retaking of South Georgia, it was thought to be some sort of an outpost and had on it. One shouldn't forget also Bird Island. That had been a summer station for many years. Shortly after this, it became a winter station and indeed a lot of the biology, particularly uh, uh, fur and feathers, is, take, is undertaken from that. One of my attractions with the island was the ability to uh, go on quite long treks to walk around much of it, with the reindeer program in particular. 1978, the Cook Glacier into St Andrews Bay, you had to be careful when to cross, you wanted low tide without too much weather. And a couple of years later, 1982, it had eroded so quickly, and now it's gone back several kilometres, all this glacier vanished surprisingly quickly. Bottom illustration, the reindeer program, when we had areas to keep them out, exclosure quadrants. They didn't take a good view of that, as you see. Sometimes it involved putting the exclusion back. Again, walking around the island 82, well, some things haven't changed. You might know Twin Rocks on the way to Mivican. There's Dead Man's Cairn on the right. That's much smaller, flattened and rebuilt as a sanger for a machine gun post. Slowly it's increasing now. 
the old tradition of picking a rock up and throwing it at it as you pass should have it. Uh, oh, well, it probably goes back to about uh, the survey of Norange Curls. Uh, give it another 100 years and it'll be back to reasonable size. Alejandro Pinero Torres sitting at the remains of a sealer's hut. Uh, that's in Hound Bay. That's on the lower left. And uh, depending on what the regulations were and who knew what was going on, there was some rather good trekking in the interior of the island. The beginning of the Arge incursion. First came a yacht, a Cayman, that claimed to be associated with Davidoff. All the indications were Davidoff wasn't quite certain with that. He'd be contacting yachts in Buenos Aires and various other sources of transport to get to see what contract, what material was in the contract he was keeping, he was arranging with Christian Salveson. He was there in December 1981 aboard Bahia Paraiso. Uh, undercover, trying to be undetected. Uh, there was not much known at that time, but uh, a visiting yacht gave some details. By a Buen successor, arrived on the 18th of March, we believe it might have been the night of the 17th, and there she was at Leith. There's another view of the vessel, and the salvage workers, I believe the total was 39 of them, were doing a lot of work fairly quickly. And in the couple of weeks while she was there, you see all the items lined up for taking aboard. Some of that was scrap metal. Some of was scrap. Once this was detected, then Steve Martin, the magistrate, contacted Rex Hunt, the governor, and the governor gave instructions to Steve, which he conveyed by the squad call radio to the field party. And there's a note that Trevor Edwards took down from the governor of the Falkland Islands, advising the yards they had landed illegally at least without obtaining proper clearance. They were instructed to take the ship to the base commander at, uh, at uh, Gritvacan at King Edward Point. And there was a question about the Bass Depot, signs and so forth, and no military personnel were allowed to land in South Georgia, and no firearms to be taken ashore. I was uh, listening to uh, quite a lot of what was happening. I'll tell you about that in a moment but uh, they were uh, also uh, hunting reindeer. Um, no doubt they thought the same as we did, they're delicious. But Steve was then spending some time in the magistrate's office at King Edward Point, typing out letters of authority to try to regularize the procedures, get a list of the personnel and do what they could have done in the first place. The Argentine flag was flying, there it is on an old switch tower. You can see the electrical connections from it at least. Once the order was given, we were interested to notice there's a fellow taking it down. The question of how much the scrap workers were involved and how much military were with them, and at the beginning who was running it, but then who finally took it over, were other questions. Once this was going, Peter Stark and myself were up on the peninsula overlooking Stromness Bay. There we're looking into Leith, that's the one between the clouds. You can see roughly what's happening with good binoculars. It came and went with the weather and listening to their radio, they were uh, mainly using channel 16 and not being at all careful about what they were saying. Hence a fair amount of the movements, what was going on, can you get me another render and things like this were picked up. We wanted to transmit this on, but didn't exactly want to do that in clear. So a case of getting behind another peak, then down below was Albatross. Then we could get it to, start to, to um, KEP, then it went to Stanley, and eventually, after a bit of Chinese whispers and things getting mixed up, we heard about what we were doing on the World Service. Anyway, that's when Endurance had returned. We were expecting Bransfield at the end of the season, but uh, circumstances were such that uh, that was, uh, well, inappropriate, much to the regret of Stuart Lawrence and the ship. But Endurance, with helicopters involved in another thing that uh, year, that summer. One of the notes that turned up later was a confidential signal from a fellow attached to the embassy in BA, signed by Williams, the ambassador. And on the 24th of March, when things were just beginning, there was the concept that uh, John Heap of the South America Department and Foreign Office mentioned the possibility that the Argentine response to such an operation is to remove a like number of opposition. Deception Island in 1952 happened. In this case, this would involve the Armada Republica Argentina, the Argentine Navy, taking off the Bass detachment from Britvigan. We didn't know about this, but the idea that was uh, 
developing fairly early. Royal Marines, 22 of them. Steve Martin took the photograph just on the last day before things happened at the end of the jetty with the whaling station behind. They were all ready for action. Endurance had left, deploying them. Endurance was on her way to Stanley. The arch arrived in Stanley before Endurance uh, was able to uh, reach the position. She came back to South Georgia covertly, wanting to remain undetected and observe what was going on. She was too late to be actively involved in the Battle of uh, Gritviken, but uh, some rather interesting photographs and details were obtained. 3rd of April 1982, Battle of Gritviken. Civilians were in the church. There's an interior of it uh, looking out, wondering what was going on. The Bass continued, were quite happy not to be involved directly with this, and the military were quite happy not to have civilians getting in the way. We got a photograph from the rather rather unclean windows higher in the church of Guarico coming in past the whaling station. She came in and uh, was rather peppered on one side, had to go past into King Edward Cove and turn round past Hobart Rocks and came out uh, and was rather peppered on the other side. The uh, lower image shows the deployments of the Royal Marines, all the uh, red posts indicated in well, the heights a couple of meters above in the area of King Edward Point uh, during the battle. Exactly what happened with us at the church, there's a little report, but a few years ago, uh, Jose Boveda published an account basically dealing with the submarine uh, Santa Fe. A little bit of it, he talks about uh, a fellow coming out from the uh, church, Lucio Nobardo Pratopita, agitando un panuelo blanco, wearing a shaggy beard and waving a uh, white panuelo's handkerchief. I've, I've translated it as cloth. There, there's my translation. Um, my Spanish is fairly reasonable, and uh, that was uh, about 2.30 in the afternoon, the first account with the Argentines. We didn't see them again, as they, we were no bother to them. The Royal Marines, on the contrary, were. And after uh, they'd surrendered, then the Argentines uh, came to see us. The afternoon or evening of the 3rd of April, that was the disposition. Four men remained on Bird Island, two at Schlieper Bay. The four at Lyle Glacier were within reasonable walking distance. It takes a couple of hours, but they, they were able to get to Gretviken and King Edward Point or the opposite way. St Andrews Bay, Cindy Buxton and Annie Price were there with three bass men, also a total of five. And King Edward Point, the Argentines had imprisoned aboard Bahia Paraiso, 35 uh, British personnel, 22 Royal Marines and 13 bass. That slide shows who was where. The same thing on a map. Two Argentine positions, Leith with the 29 salvage, salvage workers, plus we didn't know how many personnel military. King Edward Point, originally it was believed 28, and then at the end of it was the complement of the submarine Santa Fe. And you can see the four positions where British civilians remained. Lyle Glacier, in potential walking contact quite close to the Argentine position, were a bit short of food, with four of them not quite expecting to be there, but did some useful, uh, I think we can say espionage, getting up from Lyle Glacier and looking over King Edward Point and spending some time seeing what was going on, how many people were there, observing there'd be no ship or anything of that come in, was information which was conveyed uh, cautiously uh, back to uh, Britain. In prison, there's many stories I could tell you about that. It's interesting to be in prison with the Royal Marines, and I think they found it interesting to be in prison with us. We had plenty of time for talking. But there on the left is the uh, day's activities. Um, most of the time we were on prison in Bay Paraiso, but on landing in Puerto Magnano, then they'd hastily set up a prison camp for us. All the finances, as um, they were seen by quite a few officers, were accounted for, and that all went into the um, safe of the ship. Uh, that eventually came as another long story. 25th of April, a demonstration of what firepower was practical was given, and an instrument of surrender was uh, signed by the officer in charge of the Argentine garrison at King Edward Point. Although an inferior officer to him, Alfredo Astiz, in command of a rather dubious arrangement at uh, Leith Harbour, uh, refused to accept it until he was in a situation on the next day 
when he uh, signed, and this one got a colour photograph, and indeed a more impressive looking um, surrender certificate. Uh, the first one was got together rather promptly. The Argentines Times had surrendered rather promptly. So at the end of that day, there's the flag flying again. The Argentines, interestingly, rather started the war at the beginning of an Antarctic winter, which perhaps wasn't wise. It was in fact expected sometime October or November of the same year, and things might have been a little different. In the vicinity of King Edward Point, a crashed helicopter, a fellow who was aboard the submarine, it was largely because of effects of mistranslation, he was shot and buried with full military honor, as you can see, and a rather elderly submarine, Santa Fe, formerly USS Catfish, in the harbor with a very large amount of uh, ammunition in not very good condition aboard. That was eventually uh, left in rather deep water. I was back in August 1982 to try to pick up pieces and see what was going. Oh, what changes, plenty of snow, but you can see the post office with the windows prepared against blast. Uh, there's various sangers, camouflage nets, and the little civilian village had turned into a substantial military outpost on the basis of South Georgia was to a large extent the back door to the Falklands. The arch hadn't used it that way, but uh, the removal of the arch from the Falklands South Georgia with its harbors and anchorages proved very useful. Looking from Shack House of the mountains, shortly afterwards, you can see the Dominican gulls are no respecters of flags. And that is an account of uh, 40 years ago. Haven't they gone quickly? The end is questionable. I think things are resolved, but there's a placard in Oswaya where the arch are asserting Las Islas Malvinas Fortes del Sur y Serán Son y serán argentinos, are and will be Argentine. Oh ah, well, thank you. So that's a little bit, thanks Bob, about um, how it went during 1982 and the, the events. Um, so once the Brits had arrived and, and effectively removed the unwanted visitors, a small British garrison was left on the island for the next few years just to make sure that there wasn't a, re a repeat performance. And um, well, that seemed to go quite well and worked. So that was good. So there was a small garrison posted at King Edward Point um, under the command of a, a reasonably junior officer. So usually a, a major or a captain latterly. Um, and the army speak of course was OC, which is the officer commanding so now I'm going to show you a few pictures of my time there, which I'm going to share that one. And that's going to go a lot smoother. It hopefully. went perfectly. That's very, right. very annoying. <laughs> yeah, well, that's lucky. So um, from, from about the mid 1980s, while the garrison was there, the Falkland Islands developed their fishery zone. So they, they declared 150 miles zone around the Falklands and started developing their fishery. And very soon after, South Georgia did the same and started um, taking control of the fishery there, starting with just transshipment. So any, any vessel that was operating in the area was no longer just allowed to just transship fish from one ship to another willy-nilly. They had to come in to Gritvecken and do it in, the, in Cumberland Bay. Um, this was seen as an opportunity, A, to take, um, take control of the fishery of the area, but of the administration in general, in general as well. Um, but what it also meant was they could raise a bit of revenue through selling transshipment licenses, just a few hundred pounds a time, but the, the, um, it was a very small economy in those days, so that made a difference. But it also made a lot of work for the commanding officer. He had to go on board every ship, do the customs clearances, issue the transshipment license, gather the logs of what had been transshipped afterwards, preparing voices, etc. And it turned out there were large Soviet fleets fishing for the krill, which caused a lot of work for the OC, with the result that he, he was not actually getting any soldiering done. He was, and the, the MOD in the end said, look, if you want this done, you've got to get a civilian in. So in about 1990, uh, a chap called Craig Jones, colleague of mine, um, went and set up a little uh, civilian setup. And um, so he, he was then followed by a, a number of other people 
to to be stationed with the army and to go and do all this shipping administration, leaving the army to go to carry on and do some soldiering. So this is very typical of what a transshipment would look like. A, a trawler would come alongside a refrigerated cargo ship and um, transfer the, the krill to the cargo ship and then the trawler could go on and get on fishing again. So there are a series of four month marine officers. The, the job was called marine officer, which was a really great idea. If you're not a Royal Marine and you're not an officer, but you are stationed with a army. So to avoid confusion all round, we soon became known as the Harbour Master, which everyone understood a bit better. Um, so yeah, the large Soviet fleets were operating and uh, we, I was about the fourth. So in May 1992, I went down to take off, take on the burden of going on board hundreds and hundreds of Soviet ships and do all this paperwork day after day. Fortunately, the Soviet Union had collapsed. So in my four months, May to September 92, I had a grand total of 20 harbour visits, which included the reefers, a couple of trawlers, might even have been a yacht and the military ship. So it was a very, very quiet time. And um, so, I did a little bit of transshipping and, and here's me transferring from one ship to another, doing the paperwork. But the, it, there really wasn't that much to do. You just went on, gave a bit of paperwork. Um, the captain just signed the invoice. And then you had a, a long, long leisurely lunchtime on the ship, enjoying the hospitality of the Eastern fleets, which was a great job. Uh, yeah, thoroughly recommend that to anyone. So that was the work bit. But the more interesting was living with the military. It was a completely new, new thing for me, completely new people to be working with. Um, I was living in a single room in the barracks up in Shackleton House, which um, present, which was, everybody had a small room of the size of a small cupboard to themselves. We shared eating, there were army chefs, chefs, um, really really good food they say an army marches on its stomach and boy you could see that a lot of effort went into providing excellent grub uh, except on some Sundays when the rest of us would take turns giving the chefs a break and then the food wasn't always quite so good um, but I learned how to cook for a lot of people difficult life it was, it was interesting work living that closely to the military guys um, they, they did four to six month tours and they didn't volunteer. Well, very few of them volunteered. They'd already been, very often had, had been moved to say Germany with their regiment. And then just as they got settled there, they got told they were going to the Falklands, leaving their wives and families behind for four months. And then when they got to the Falklands, half of them got told, actually you're going to South Georgia where there aren't any bars. There are no local girls, there's no dancing. Um, there's nowhere to go not really much of interest so it's pretty pretty tricky for them now, a few of them really did did get into the outdoor bit so the, the skiing and the, the out and the wildlife um but quite hard for them quite a lot of the time there are, by the time i arrived there were 40 in the garrison um so a small unit of infantry who were the fighting soldiers and supported with signalers who kept communications going with the Falklands, Royal Engineers who kept the lights on and the boats working and everything else going, chefs, a doctor, and a couple of Royal Marines. Um, later on, as time went on and uh, money needed to be saved, the infantry element was removed and uh, it went down to about 20 people uh, who were just a, a logistic support so that we could keep our job going. So the communications in those days, well, I had a handheld VHF radio for communicating with the ships. Um, whereas nowadays you'd, you'd hear days in advance exactly when a ship's coming in. In those days, the, the radio crackled into life and then you had to get everyone moving, get the boats organized and within a couple of hours, get out to the ships. Military had a HF radio telex so you could you could write your message on a piece of paper, take it to the radio shack, and then they would telex it to the Falklands who could either mail it into Stanley or, or beyond. We had a fax machine, but in those days, the government really didn't have any money. So I was under strict instructions 
to use one page of facts a month, giving a quick round up to government house of what had been going on and not to spend any more money than that. I could have phoned, but that was £7.50 a minute, so didn't. My wife Sarah, meanwhile, was still in the Falklands, so we set up a, a ham radio, but that wasn't really good. But Friday night, we could still have a, a little chat, which was better than nothing. And then there was the airdrops. You can see the photographs here. Um, every month, a ship would come in with the mail and take the mail away, and in between, um, a a C-130 Hercules would be sent from the Falklands to drop mail, which is very welcome uh, for the, the guys are used in the military to having a really good communications and mail. So every two weeks was not as often as they were used to, even in war-torn areas. So, so a, um, a parachute of mail coming in was always very welcome. And here's a little boat going out to fetch it. A couple of japes, once the um, guys in the aeroplane stuffed a... Stuffed, stuffed a set of overalls full of paper and threw it out the back. So we thought someone had fallen out. Another time they scattered a lot of paper that looked like letters out, um, but it, it wasn't real letters, which still upset the guys a bit. Some of the opportunities I took there with this free time and with the Royal Marines there was to, to be very, very fortunate to learn my mountain craft and skiing and climbing, etc. at the hands of a guy whose job is to teach someone else, to teach someone else who doesn't want to know how to survive in the mountains. So I was very, very well instructed and learned some really good habits, which have kept me alive. Um, and this is one trip. Chris in the background was the Royal Marine. He was under instructions not to go more than about two hours away from Gritvik and but he reckoned that uh, he was never going to get thrown out of the Marine mountain leader branch for going and climbing a mountain. So he gathered me and uh, this is Tim Carr, who was also there. He and Pauline were um, living on the yacht on the island, working at the mu museum at the time. And he, he dragged us about three quarters of the way up Mount Sugartop before day broke. Tim and I took one look at it and decided that that was far enough and turned around. And then Chris just went and soloed the rest. Amazing. But then to spoil my fun in 1993, um, a 200-mile a, a maritime zone was declared around South Georgia, and that turned into a lot more work because we now had to issue fishing licenses to all those ships, inspect them, and go on board and do more meaningful inspections of the transshipments of fish when they came in. Also, in the early days, we had limited communication, so I would be sent, receiving a catch report every day from every ship, and that could be up to 10 of them calling by radio in various languages, which needed a bit of translating to work out what they were saying. And then a lot of typing of that stuff into a database. So it suddenly became not such a, an exciting time, um, but still really interesting to do. And we need a lot more boat support. We also did, did quite a lot of um, training with the, the who did this um, training courses in advanced medical life support which is really, really good. The, I think I've skipped on a picture. The, the army guys were ready all the time. They, they had uh, bunkers that they built, and they manned from time to time, um, just ready, practicing exercises, waiting just in case there was gonna be an invasion, which thank goodness never happened. And then in the late 1990s, the army were being more and more stretch for resources money was short there was no real threat anymore in south georgia so they they decided that they really wanted to be out however the foreign office needed there to be someone there so they went and asked bass if they would go and take over the um the administration there but back, no we're also on limited funding and supplies and all we want to do is being done done further south and we've already done all the geology and the biology at, at King Edward Point. So it wasn't, it wasn't an easy project to move from the army to the British Antarctic Survey, but eventually a deal was struck between the South Georgia government, the Foreign Office, British Antarctic Survey, and the MOD to build a new station and find a way of paying for it, but it used whatever resources they had, and it was done on an incredibly low budget but on time and a completely new station was built. Wisely, the British Antarctic Survey didn't want to be spending all their money 
maintaining ancient drafty falling down buildings so they insisted on new buildings and so new buildings were put up and they were able to incorporate extra things um, for instance the we, we had this fishing boat quest was supplied so they could do some science fishing. They um, incorporated renewables, so a windmill went up. Um, they also put solar power on some of the buildings to heat water. Windmill turned out not to be, it was a good experiment in as much as it, it, we learned from it that wind power on South Georgia really isn't good. You've either got no wind or far too much wind. So um, they've moved on from that and now actually more recently introduced hydroelectric. So finally, in March 2001, the, the new station was opened. Um, the commissioner for South Georgia on the left, Donald Lamont, and Chris Rapley, the director of the British Antarctic Survey, and then uh, the grand um, fisheries biologist, Inigo Everson on the right there, um, or, as well as many military people, all convened on the island for a great opening ceremony. And you can see there the laboratory was called the James Cook Laboratory. Originally, it was going to be called the Everson Laboratory after Ever Everson's amazing um, science work, on, particularly on krill. But then they, they realised that their plans to name the accommodation half of the building after Captain Cook was going to be a result of calling it the Cook House, which they decided against. they sought them over and called it James Cook Laboratory and then Everson House, where everyone lives. Amongst all the buildings that the British Antarctic Survey weren't interested in, in keeping were a couple of historic ones, but luckily, although some of them, such as the post office here, were in the way and had to go, one or two others were kept, so the marine laboratory from the discovery investigations dating back to the 20s and the jail dating back before that have been preserved and have been refurbished or in use still. But unfortunately, the post office, which was a, the iconic building on the jetty, that did go and was replaced by a rather grand big building. This one, the boat shed, workshops, generator sheds, etc. But what we did do was we rescued some of the wood the tongue and groove lining from the post office and we put that in the bar in the new Everson building so this is soon after the construction you can see the nice tongue and groove of the bar there as brings a bit of a life and the history of the post office into that building and then if any of you ever go and visit the bar there and are invited in you'll see there are other bits of um, memorabilia including for anyone who's whoever lived on in Shackleton House, you'll remember the copper top bar there. The copper we also kept and put on the bar in Everson House. So again, part of the history has you, was, was preserved on the site. So now we've got a brand new base with science being done in support of the fishery and the army in March 1990, uh, 2001 were able to go and get back to their families and back to the real, real soldiering they needed to do. So that was a bit of a story of my time there. And now I'll hand you over to Jamie. If I can unshare my screen. Jamie, tell us what it's like now. All right. Um, give me one second. Uh, it's nice to know every time we dropped you off on um, the fishing vessels to do work. Now I, I know that you were just drinking with the captain. All right. Yeah, sadly, once it got a bit more professional with the fishing licenses and arrests, we had to stop all that. And now, now it's it's a, a much more professional setup. But I, I was there in the good old days. <laughs> um, well, yeah, thank you very much. Um, that's interesting hearing what base was like before I was there. Uh, I'm going to move things on to more recent times. Um, so I was on uh, South Georgia for the first time. To 2015 I got there um, and overlapped with Pat during my first winter 2015-16 uh, seasons um, and then have just returned from another winter and between them I uh, spent a little uh, well, a summer stint on Beard Island so uh, some things have changed um, many things haven't South Georgia is still absolutely ridiculous landscapes um, the wildlife um, is a massive part of life on on South Georgia, especially as a scientist, you're living in and amongst it. Um, it's absolutely incredible. 
most of the wildlife colonies are still there. Some of them are growing. Um, I guess most importantly, um, the bar is still there um, that, that Pat just talked about. Um, and our living quarters actually look very similar to what they did. The bar has been decorated by lots of bits of tat. Um, you may notice the, the mummified wrap that's above the bar there still. Um, but yeah, very similar kind of setup from, from when it was originally built. Um, this is my last um, wintering team and you'll, you'll notice that there's still um, some very suspect haircuts in amongst the teams, uh, questionable hair, um, or facial hair, but not quite as many um, checkered shirts nowadays. Um, but it's not a big team. So this is uh, this year's uh, wintering team. Um, and so to keep everything running throughout the winter, you've got two, three government officers um, on base, plus the bass team, which is made up of a sparky, a mechanic, uh, two scientists, station leader, doctor, and two boating officers. And more or less, we all know what we're doing or we're really good at um, blagging our way through the job. But what that means with having such a, a limited team um, is that you kind of, there's a lot of involved um, because everyone can do their day-to-day -day work, but if things go wrong, if there's some, an emergency on the hill or um, some kind of medical emergency, um, there's a leak somewhere, then we all kind of have to chip in, uh, which is great because it means, um, you're learning all sorts of um, interesting things. So oil spill training, you see us practicing x-rays here on penguins, apparently you're not allowed to do it to, um, to people in practice, um, but the penguins, they were already frozen by the way. Um, and then we would, we, well, we take every opportunity to get outside. So whenever the weather was good, uh, in the winter we'd get out on skis, in the summer it would be by foot, um, and everyone is kind of fighting to get out and explore. We have a huge, huge travel limit. Um, so allowed to get across to other peninsulas, up lots of hills, um, and all basically fighting over who doesn't stay on station um, and have to cover comms for safety. Um, but sadly, the weather isn't always great. And so we spend uh, a lot of time on station and um, when you're stuck indoors and it's blowing outside and it's snowing um, I guess you have to get quite creative in the ways that you keep yourself entertained um, so there's a lot of board games uh, involved in life um, some very good improvising uh, some interesting improvisation of entertainment as well so this picture on the right hand side is taken this was my first winter because Pat's in the picture what a beautiful shirt he's wearing there um, and yeah, as I said, improvisation. So our Sparky Robbie set up um, a Glastonbury festival inside the lounge, um, remodeled all of the furniture. Um, the comms were, were marginally better than what, well, no, they're significantly better, but still nothing compared to what you have um, back here. Um, and so over a period of a week, I think we were able, or sorry, over a month, we were able to download the highlights of Glastonbury. Um, um, it was a year old, um, but yeah, we all dressed up like Wally's and uh, watched highlights of Glastonbury. So you find, you make your own entertainment. Um, so um, fancy dress is still a very important way of life. Um, sadly, well, you can decide if it's a good thing or a bad thing. Cross-dressing seems to be dying out. Um, but as you can see with David's wonderful legs, it still happens occasionally. And then in, in summer, we have kind of an influx of people coming in, so associated with the museum and tourism. Um, and also there's a South Georgia government building team that come and they kind of bring a lot of energy, ideas for entertainment um, and more improvisation and creativity. So this is, um, this was actually, uh, didn't play, yeah, so, the builders actually built a bowling alley uh, in the now derelict um, whaling station, which is uh, pretty amazing. Um, they actually shipped down actual bowling balls as well. Um, so that gave us a lot of entertainment in, in evenings. Um, 
and then you get a lot more visits as well from ships or yachts um, throughout the, the summer months and so sometimes from research programs um, often we'll have navy ships in and also cruise ships are becoming more and more of a um, uh, well, more frequent visitors as well so they uh, provide a nice change from the usual day to day and so when the, the navy come in Obviously, their main role is um, patrolling the islands. They still do find um, some explosive or um, ammunition around the island, which they'll detonate. Um, but the main reason they come in is for uh, football matches. Um, so they come from, from miles all the way from the UK uh, to, to play football on the International Football Stadium of South Georgia. Um, and you'll notice a couple of things from the picture. Well, the Bass team in white is sponsored by Penguins, um, and that there are more Bass players with steel toe caps um, boots than actual trainers, which tells you something about um, the football pitch and uh, the terrain that we play on. So home advantage very much is a big thing. Um, as I mentioned earlier, obviously comms have got better and better over the years. Um, we do occasionally still get blackouts, um, but it is infinitely better than what um, Pat described. We have semi-functioning internet um, and the line li landlines will work as well with only a few seconds delay. So you can kind of make do. Um, there's still no chance of streaming films, um, but at least you can stay in contact with the outside world with WhatsApp. But one of the best things that comes from better internet is the ability to kind of contact other stations. Um, and so we'll often, um, play darts matches against Bird Island and Rothera and uh, this picture is taken so every single year there is a 48 hour film competition um, and so this is all of the Antarctic stations this isn't just the British ones uh, all of the nationalities and it's a designated weekend we all get given um, told when it is and on a Friday night you'll kind of write a plot um, spend a Saturday acting um, doing things that you think are amazing um, because you've just spent an entire winter in isolation um, and filming it and then you send a five minute video out to all of the stations and you judge each other and you compare just how crazy and isolated each other um, has gone basically throughout their winter and you get judged on, um, on various different things I think um, how well you incorporate the, um, the environment is one of them um, comedy as well, comedic effect potentially as well. Um, and it gets sent back to the HQ in, in Cambridge as well. So it's a good kind of feeler for them of just kind of what state we're going to be when the new team comes in. Um, so as Pat's already talked about, um, massive part of Bass being there, a uh, massive part of the life um, on station is to do with the fisheries, uh, especially nowadays. So. Um, bass support operations, but also carry out a lot of science along with the, the tooth fisheries. Um, so you have the krill trawlers and the toothfish long lines. Um, and occasionally you also have ice fish um, fishing as well. Um, but we also, so this all operates throughout the winter months um, so that there's min minimal um, competition with the wildlife, but we continue to monitor the wildlife and look at the effects on the ecosystem throughout the the summer as well. Um, so during the winter months, we'll get given uh, lots of samples, for example, otoliths for processing and working out um, the, the size of the toothfish uh, population and, and setting quotas. Um, also, we'll get lots of toothfish stomachs. And if you can take the smell, uh, it's a usually a uh, really kind of fun bit of life that people want to get involved with, especially if you tell them there's a chance of finding a colossal squid inside the stomach of a toothfish. Uh, this year, we found a couple, but they were small. Mostly it was actually chinstrap limbs, chin, chinstrap penguins, which is pretty impressive when you consider that the, the toothfish were taken from, what, 1,200 metres um, of water. And so we have uh, five very nice boats now, um, and they belong to South Georgia government, but they're run by bass. And the main reason for these is, is to take people or take the fishing uh, sorry, the government officers out to the fishing vessels where they'll carry out uh, inspections um, and also check that the conditions are safe for crew 
And uh, obviously a modern part of life is also checking for signs and evidence of rats on board. Um, but the real reason for these um, boats is, or the best part of these boats, I should say, um, is that it allows us to get out to other peninsulas. Um, so they're really just taxis to get us on holiday um, with the bus staff and we get across to stay in some of the field huts around the island. So this is St Andrew's Bay, which is um, incredible place to stay. Um, another great thing about the boats is you need a really big garage in order to store them. Uh, but when the boats are out, um, it's a really nice, dry, sheltered place to play sports. So this is um, a game of volleyball in the boat ship. I guess the final part of the fishing puzzle is um, the Pharos, um, the really subtle um, red fisheries patrol vessel that the government have. And that obviously patrols the waters around South Georgia, looking for illegal um, fishing vessels, which uh, fortunately, they well, very rarely frequent upon, um, but also uh, they're really important kind of part of our daily life. They'll also bring us post and fresh food um, every six weeks or so. Um, and more and more, they're getting involved with science as well. So um, for those of you that know the, the Pharos, you'll know that it's not often uh, looking as still as this. Um, and um, it's not the most stable ships, or it, in fact, I'm told it's very stable, but it's not the most smooth uh, to sail on. Um, it's flat bottom hull built for um, the inland locks of uh, Scotland. And so this is kind of more stereotypical uh, being on South Georgia waters. This is how we get down to South Georgia um, and get back from South Georgia is on board the Faro. So a lot of people will just step on, you'll, you'll walk on board the ship with them and then you don't see them until uh, you step off, what, um, five days later. Uh, they look a lot lighter as well when they get off the ship. Just go back to this picture, um, or the, the boat shed. Um, so recently I was talking to Michael Stansbury, who was a glaciologist back in 59, 61, uh, till 61. And, um, he was convinced he set up the southernmost badminton club in the world. So I wanted to uh, include this picture just to show that it is still going strong, although I'm sure there are probably more southern um, badminton clubs now. Um, but um, one thing talking to him um, was really interesting. Um, he's obviously a glaciologist, seeing some of his pictures, even just seeing the difference in the seven years that I spent on South Georgia. The climate and environment is changing very rapidly now. Um, and so this is a picture of the Hodges Glacier, which um, Michael was studying. Um, this is what it looks like now. Um, so it was studied all the way through to the, the 80s. Um, and again, this is on the left hand side, a picture that he took of the Hamburg and Harker glaciers, which um, I think took 2006. Uh, the Harker was one of four glaciers on the whole of South Georgia that wasn't receding. And you can see with my picture on the right hand side that uh, that is not the case anymore. So seeing massive losses in ice and really warm temperatures across the island uh, quite frequently now. Um, but the changes aren't all bad. We now have um, lots, well, fur seals everywhere, uh, especially around station. Um, even seven years ago, there wasn't as many as there is now. We had three, 400 pups um, born outside and around station this last year, um, which, is, which is great. Um, mostly, I should say, um, when you get woken up by a screaming pup at four o'clock in the morning, whose mum is, what, 10 metres away, then uh, it's not always the best. Or, and it does mean you have to pay a bit more attention when you're walking around uh, station at night, um, because these guys are lurking. The science has also kind of changed and is becoming a lot less invasive, which is a great thing. Uh, this is Adrian Fox here um, launching a fixed wing drone on a project that we were uh, carrying out this season. Um, and so drones are becoming a lot more uh, bigger part of science and life on South Georgia now. Um, so they'll fly over the island. You can launch them from a safe distance away from colonies um, and get really accurate counts of uh, just how many um, penguins or seals that there are on um, on the colonies without having to walk through them. Um, another big change is uh, the island is obviously rat free. I came to South Georgia just after it came, uh, just after the eradication finished. Um, and so um, in my 
first season there was no Pippet song and now kind of Pippet song is everywhere, which is really uplifting in the spring. Um, also, we're finding burrowing petrol colonies expanding and even new colonies uh, in new places already, which is great to see. Um, one of the best parts of the rats going is that obviously you have to keep the rats gone. And so we get frequented or visited by uh, the sniffer dogs every now and then. This is Sammy who came this year um, and they'll travel around the island, look at frequent um, landing sites and also uh, ships and just inspect for signs of rats and make sure we don't have any accidental introductions. Um, and yeah, it is um, the, the it's not just uh, the birds that are recovering or some of, some of the birds that are recovering, I should say, it's not all are, um, but we are witnessing the recovery of the whales at the moment. Um, it's been incredible just over the last seven years to see them coming back. Uh, in summer months, you'll see lots of humpbacks usually within the bays. Um, and if you're lucky enough to get on the fowls and travel around the islands, then you'll see many other species potentially as well. Um, I think in March, we saw three mother calf blue whales in a day um, off the coast of Fortuna, which was absolutely incredible. And just to finish by saying that um, it's obviously still changing. So this is a picture of the Sir David Attenborough um, coming into South Georgia, coming into uh, King Edward Point for the first time ever. And that was taken this, this March. Um, and it's incredible, well, just to think about all of the new science that's going to be able to be carried out as a result of having uh, this vessel and also hopefully um, logistics will, will run a little more smoothly now that we've got a larger more capable ship um, so yeah there's a lot more still to come thank you very much oh brilliant thanks very much Jamie that's that's yeah interesting nice, nice memories there as well of uh, the filmmaking that's great fun um, I know some of the 48 film 48 hour film entries are, are out there on YouTube somewhere. So anyone who's got a lifetime to waste can dig around and see what you can see on YouTube. We've had a couple of questions in. Firstly, from Ricky, who oh, I remember. Hi, Ricky. Great, great to uh, hear. You. Who's asking what happened to all the mem memorabilia in Shackleton House? There was the, um, the, the bar there, which had all sorts of pictures um, and yeah, memorabilia of all sorts hanging up all around it. When the when the military moved out, we carefully collated that, collected it together, um, and most of that has gone into the museum collection. There isn't room, unfortunately, for it to go on display, but um, most of that stuff, including all the various photographs, it's been a tradition in all the Antarctic bases and was carried on with the military that every detachment left a photograph up on the wall. So all those photographs are still there. And the one thing you might be interested in, Ricky, is that the doctors used to keep a, a board with the name of each doctor that had come through, and that still exists. That's in the, the um, medical centre still, or it, it was a few years, three or four years ago, last time I went through. Um, I'm sure all that's still there. So, uh, it still exists, which is great. We've also had another question from Christine, which I think is for Jamie. And Christine asks, oh, she disappeared. She visited Grit, Gritvik in this winter after Antarctica. Why wasn't she invited to the bar? Jamie, why wasn't she? In, why, why, why didn't you invite Christine to the bar? Um, you visited, well, uh, sadly, COVID has ruined everything. Um, otherwise, I would have definitely invited you up to the bar, uh, possibly. Uh, <laughs> um, no, we get lots of um, visits from the cruise ships and, and normally we would interact with them a lot more, uh, less so than coming up uh, to our bar. Um, but we come on to your bar um, and drink all of your, your booze and eat all of your nice uh, fancy food. And, well, usually it's just the, the salads that we eat. Um, but with with COVID, um, it's been difficult. Um, and so the base is in a different bubble from all of the ships. So we have to stay behind a barrier. Ah, great. Thanks. So one, once COVID's over in the next few months and it's all a dim, distant memory, we'll we'll all come back off the ships, knock on the door and be warmly invited back into 
Everson House. I suspect that won't be the case because with um, the number of ships getting to 80 to 100 visits over the summers these days, um, you wouldn't really get anything else done. So I guess we, we need to stay away and let you get, get some science going. I'm trying to think if we had any other questions. Yeah, there was one, yes, Trevor was asking, what, what did we think the stewardship of South Georgia would be like if the Argentines had, had stayed in charge? Um, maybe Bob, you might have an insight on this one. Can't hear you. Interesting that point as to what might have happened with uh, Argentina, bearing in mind the uh, way uh, their stations are run, it's very much a military operation. Uh, some things have improved considerably, some bases go back for quite a long time, but I rather suspect the nation's very strong aspects of territoriality would have prevailed rather than a, um, a more reasonable Antarctic Survey international aspect. Things like any resources and money, money from fisheries uh, and their uh, sovereignty would have been emphasized very strongly. Yeah, thanks. One, one thing that's always impressed me is that the money that comes in from fishing licenses and the tourism is kept in the South Georgia pot and spent on South Georgia. It's not taken away just to become part of the UK's revenue. It's a very much separate economy, which does mean that the money from the fishing licenses, particularly in good fishing years has been there to pay for things like um, the reindeer eradication, the ongoing weed work to keep um, plants down and the other science that go, goes on and particularly uh, the maintenance of the fishery protection vessel which has been an absolute game changer. Back in my day we had poachers every now and then um, they'd borrow a Falklands protection vessel come in and rest someone and then I'd go on board and do all the charging but now there's a of protection vessel on site the whole time you just don't get poachers who, and that means that we could be much more comfortable about how much fish is really being taken out of the ocean which helps the management fisher is one thing Science any another. other oh, look oh, at the oh. productivity and the amount of research and papers coming from british sources antarctica generally bass in particular and compare with instituto antarctico argentino value for money and interests are balanced differently. That's a very good way of putting it. All right, so we'll just have a quick flip through. Very differently. Yeah. Yeah, that, well, there are a few questions there, but we've run on quite a bit now. So I think um, we'd better stop there. But thanks everyone for coming and really interesting to hear from Jamie and Bob, and uh, I always love the sound of my own voice, so that, that bit was great too. Um, hope you all had a lovely evening, um, and hopefully we'll catch up with you again sometime for another talk in the next few months. So yeah. Perhaps with slides. Thanks. Bye. Yes, I hope so. Okay, bye then.